everybody, and welcome to An Evening with Luna Press. Tonight, you're here with us for the premiere launch of the new Luna novella series. And I am surrounded by our lovely authors from around the world. Now, thank you for joining us, no matter where you are. And just so you know, we have authors from all time zones, as well as the UK, we have the US, and we have Eugene Bacon from Australia. You will see her, she's here, I swear, even if you can't see her, okay? So let's start, first of all, to introduce uh, ourselves, and I'm going to go first. So I am Francesca Barbini, I'm the owner of Luna Press Publishing, and I am delighted to introduce you to our marvelous authors. So we're going to start in order of novella release, so with the Luna novella number 13, Eugene Bacon. Thank you, thank you very much. I am so excited to be part of this wonderful novella set. I am Eugene Bacon. I am African-Australian. I live in Melbourne in Australia. I am a mother, a daughter, a scholar, an editor, an author, a peer, a mentor and a friend. I love writing Black people stories, which is what Broken Paradise is about. It's a Black people story with magical realism. Thank you very much, Eugene. So, Luna Novella number 14, uh, Andrew. Hi, uh, my name's Andrew Knighton. I'm a freelance writer whose work includes ghost writing, history articles, short stories and comics. And I wrote Ashes of the Ancestors. Thank you, Andrew. And then we are moving on from fantasy, fantasy to horror with uh, Abigail F. Taylor, Luna Novella number 15. Hi, everyone. My name is Abigail F. Taylor, and I am a Texas poet and novelist, and I wrote the horror novella The Night Begins. Thank you, Abby. OK, now we're moving back to fantasy and to the UK with uh, Jess. Jess, novella number 16. Hi, everyone. I'm Jess Hislop. Um, I mainly write fantasy, uh, sometimes science fiction. Um, so far, I've mainly written short stories. Um, they featured in Black Static, uh, Interzone and Interzone Digital. Um, but I am also working on a fantasy novel at the moment. And I wrote uh, the novella Miasma. Thank you very much, Jess. And novella number 17. LK Kidney, Laura, Laura from Orkney, the north of Scotland. Yeah, hi, I'm Laura. I write as LK Kidney and I live in Orkney, as said. Um, and I wrote The Lies We Tell Ourselves. Thank you, Laura. And last but not least, uh, from the States uh, with novella number 18, uh, Chloe. Science fiction, Chloe. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Chloe Smith. I'm a science fiction and fantasy writer based in the Bay Area in California. Um, I've had short stories appear in places like Metaphorosis and Innocent Digital and Three Loved Burning Eye. Um, besides uh, writing, I'm also a proofreader for Fantasy Magazine and I teach middle school. Uh, and my novella is Virgin Land. Perfect, thank you very much. So welcome all of our authors. And now uh, let's get into it with uh, our novellas. I would like uh, for all of you at home to find out a bit more about our novellas. So we're going to ask our writers to tell us what their story is about and the inspiration behind it. Okay, so we're going to start with you, Eugene. Yes, I wanted to write a story of family and how a family can be strung together or tear itself. I wanted to write a story of motherhood because I am a mother and a story of kinship. And finally, I wanted to write a story of magic, the responsibility that power demands when we hold it and how so easily we can misuse it. So I am naturally a short story writer than a novelist, which means that a novella offers a perfect balance. It's in between. I love the short story because it's experimental, it's flexible, it's intense. And so I can use the merits of the short story in the novella and bring in immediacy and intensity to layer into a longer work story by story. 
and this is a novel, uh, a novella that I wrote really in sequence. And I started first with Namulongo, which is the middle of the story. And I, I really connected with the characters because Namulongo is a child. And it's again, uh, I connected. And I became very curious because I wondered what happens before Namulongo's story and what happens afterwards. And so this story needed a beginning and it needed an ending. And this is how I uncovered and reveled in a story of gods, a story of magic and mythology. And it's also cross-lingual because when I worked on the magic, it uses Swahili words. So Broken Paradise has the themes of gods, it has magical realism and sibling rivalry. And so uh, when I talk about it, when I think about it in a one liner, I think of it as a quadruplet is perfect for Maji we got from a goddess, but are things ever equal, which is where all the tension comes in. I'd like to share with you a part of the story from the beginning, A Goddess of the Waters. And this is Samaki's story. Samaki is a goddess and she's made the critical decision to split herself into four magi in order to get away from her brothers. A coven of magi. Samaki reaches the ocean stands at its shores with a sea ghost. There's one way to mask her trace. Daga will not be expecting it. She's struggled with the idea for a while now, but it's the only way that Pose won't see through it. She has used the spell of creation once and it gave her a companion. Now, she must use it again on herself. It's a risky thing to bring life from non-life. And when it's on yourself, she touches the water, slips into it. Njo wangu amuka. She chants, eyes closed, repeatedly. Jo wangu amuka. The water churns. She has mastered all the spells. Now there's obligation to create. Jo wangu amuka. Samaki cries in agony as she splits in two, then two again to make four. She looks at the quality of herself. She's Kolwa, she knows this. She's a priestess of oceans and seas. She sees her reflection on the sea ghost's mist, her tight black hair and even face. She doesn't look anything like Samaki. She rolls her eyes and begins to shudder in a chant. It's a unique incantation, her very own. No one else can use it. Her familiar is the sea ghost, seas translucent, male and female and see fogs. I am Dotto, I know this, says her second self. I am a priestess of rivers and lakes. She has satin skin and golden brown eyes, a smooth face, the shape of an egg, long slippery hair, her soul chant is silent, but they can all hear it. Pili, Mimi, Nenda, Pote. Her familiar is swimming at her feet. 
It's a water demon, a bitch with long fingers. I am Mazu, says her third self. I am a priestess of seabeds and islands. Her eyes are blue-green pearls. She has yellow skin, hair like ferns that fall to her shoulders. She glares and hisses her chant. Changu dobe ni zawadi. Her familia noses at her feet. It's a baby whale. I am Saba, says the false self. I am a priestess of water creatures. She's bold, gentle. She hands her chant. Dodo tari naita leo. Her familia is a seahorse, right there, bobbing on her palm. The quaddity looks at each other, at itself, together and bidden the four magi chant. The spell of creation is Genesis. The quaddity is four. It always is full. Imbalance will bring calamity. Kulwa looks at her four cells. She's family, old and family. She's new. Together, they chime all night. Sealing the pact of a coven of magi must in quantity. Parting is never easy, but it's obligation. Dawn shines bright under a new sun. A whirlwind of sand and water ushers each of the four new magi on their separate path to master that which they command. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Eugene. All right, then, Andrew, tell us more about the Ashes of the Ancestors. Um, so Ashes of the Ancestors is a fantasy story set in a haunted monastery. For generations, the spirits of great leaders have been preserved there to guide the living. But now their empire is dying and a lone priest, Magdalisa, is left tending the fires for the dead. Her people's last link to the wisdom of the past, Magdalisa's life is shaken by new arrivals who force her to reconsider the truths her life was built on. It's a story about how we relate to the past, the ways that history and tradition can be ladders that lift us up or chains that bind us down. I've spent a lot of my life studying and writing about history, uh, which has made me incredibly aware of this tension about the good that a focus on the past can do us and the harm it can do us and the importance of, of connecting to it in the right way. Um, but it was something Jeanette Ng said in an acceptance speech that pushed me into writing this story. Um, she said, let us be better than the legacies that have been left us. Let them not be prophecies. And Ashes of the Ancestors is about one person learning to do just that. Oh, thank you. That's, that's excellent. It is a beautiful story, and um, I I was feeling uh, very much for Magdalisa uh, when I when I first read her. You know, because you can tell that she was she's really invested in what she does, and she has this strong belief uh, in in traditions. You know, and I think most of us can certainly relate to that, even when yeah. those traditions perhaps it might be even time to let them go. Sometimes, you know, but it's very it's very hard thing to do because they make up your cultural heritage, don't they? Um, yes, so. and, and they can, the, the good and the bad, bad parts are often held together. They're not separate, they're tangled up. So working out how to deal with that is, you know, something we probably fail at every day. Yeah, well, probably mm -hmm. that's why it makes it so hard to ditch some of the tradition, isn't it? Because you know you're going to lose some of the good 
apart, like you said, because uh, they are, you know, they are yeah. together. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I think now it's time for a little reading from Ashes of the Ancestors. Mm -hmm. So here is the cover for Andrew's novella. So uh, this is from near the end of chapter two. Um, it's, uh, it's a funeral scene. Watched by a congregation of ghosts, Magdalisa is about to let another priest named Adrana light a funeral pyre, but then she notices that something is wrong. She changed everything, Adrana had said. I had been too distracted to recognise the tone in which she said it. The fever that killed my family had changed everything for me. I stepped hurriedly between her and the altar. She stopped, the tongs outstretched. Standing right by the altar, I slid my hand into the kindling, dry twigs jabbing, tar sticking to my skin. There was something smooth and hard in there, something that hadn't been present when I assembled the bundle. A curved surface, no bigger than a child's fist. It was so cold that it stung my questing fingers, but I closed my hand around it and drew it from the pyre. Again, I felt every eye in the chapel fall upon me. I should show them what I had found, tell them that Adrana was not what she seemed. I turned. She was inches from me and the coal between those tongs glowed so close I could feel its heat on my skin. There was no fear in her face, only anger. An icy orb lay in my palm, unseen by anyone else. I slid my hands up my sleeves and stepped out of her way. To let air in, I said quietly, nodding to the broken bundle of kindling. Now, the ceremony must continue. Adrana stared at me. Era should burn, she said. Then light the pyre. I stepped back into the shelter of the transept. The holies closed in around the altar as Adrana, her hand trembling, thrust the coal into the base of the fire. Flames flashed across tired, tired kindling then swept up the heap of dry wood, carried high by the wind blowing from the grapes. In moments, a pillar of flame stretched to the distant ceiling, its light lending colour to the pale faces of the spirits. Seraphios knelt among the morning warriors, while Chrysania stood at Jodrana's side, an ephemeral hand resting on her shoulder, the two of them staring intently into the flames. The inferno's roar was a bestial voice filling the eternal abbey. In the shadows of the transept, I drew my hand from my sleeve, uncurled half-frozen fingers, and saw an egg, its shell a sparkling blue. My breath frosted as it fell across the shell of something I couldn't understand. A phoenix egg. Futio whispered, the largest I've ever seen. It feeds off funeral flames to be reborn. What would have happened if... I looked at the pyre, its ashes cast aloft by fingers of flame. A new beginning, Fotio said, and he smiled. But first, an end. He looked up. An end for all of this. Before I could ask him more, he let his body go. Ashes snatched by the updraft rising through the chapel, joining those of the late Duchess as her body was consumed by fire. The ashes around the altar twisted in the rising draft, formed a pillar, then a human shape. A woman in a chainmail shirt, with a long dagger resting against one hip and a battle axe against the other. 
A heavy cloak hung from her shoulders, held in place by a fist-shaped brooch. She tilted her head to look down at herself, and jewelled beads clapped in the braids of her hair. My blade is yours forever, the pallbearers cried out in unison. The drana sank to her knees, and I followed her lead, staring at the ghost of the Duchess Eris. May her spirit grant us steel. Oh, excellent, Andrew. Thank you. Wow. Very evocative. <laughs> excellent. Thank you. Okay, then. So from the world of epic fantasy, we are now going into the woodland uh, rural side of Texas for a little bit of horror. So, Abby, first of all, would you like to tell us about uh, your story and uh, your inspiration behind it? So my novella, The Night Begins, is about freshman uh, Darcy Mills. When Darcy receives a letter from Althea asking for help uh, with downsizing move to Dallas so that they can be closer, she's excited about uh, the prospect of reconnecting. But facing the frightening memories trapped in the walls of her child home is not as frightening as the monster that haunts her in the woods. So while she's dealing with building a relationship with her axe-wielding alleged murderer mother, there's also a monster in the forest planning on taking her skin. And it's something that she's done on the way to her mom's house that kind of caught the creature's attention. Okay, very, very intriguing. So tell us uh, about, you know, the inspiration behind this story. Um, well, I've always found it interesting how uh, people can have such uh, complicated and loving relationships with cantankerous and abusive uh, family members and friends and how it kind of unfolds from that and the links that they go to to stick with one over the other in spite of the dangers that might present itself versus the dangers that are there in front of them. Uh, as far as the creating the monster, it came from my whole family on both sides are um, very oral storytellers. And so I grew up with um, one grandmother reading me, always reading us Edward Gorey's uh, Rumpelstiltskin, another one telling us about skinwalkers and wendangos and um, all the creatures that we shouldn't be calling attention to at night. And uh, so but between those stories and then my parents' stories, my dad, who's also a writer, he used to raise us up on our bedtime stories. So I've had, and Celtic mythology, so I've had this huge amalgamation of different stories coming together. And I thought, well, write what you know. And the fact that America is such a, um, a mix of all these different things coming together that there might be a creature that's a mix of all these things, all these different cultures coming together that stick in the forest and lie in wait for people to remember them by. And when they don't remember them, that's when they come out. Absolutely. We are ready to be scared now. So, okay. If you would like to give uh, us a little bit from your book. Okay, so I'll be reading from the introduction and part of chapter two of The Night Begins. Mama lives alone on the hill. The way I always heard it, she brought the axe down on daddy. But I figure as long as I'm not in her shit list, there's no harm in dropping by for a visit. It doesn't take long to get down to the hill country, a few hours at most. It's an easy drive with long, lazy stretches where you don't have to check with the map. It gets trickier in the autumn when the dust settles real quick like and the shadows stretch long and wide fingering all those doubts you ever had at the, at the safety of the hills. Whether you've known the hills your whole life with the back of your hand comfort or not, shadows distort the earth and remind you that everything you thought you knew was a lie. Nature has a way of creeping out of the concrete. I've always liked seeing the little bits of ivy pushing its blue and purple veined flowers along the sides of buildings or dandelion tufts that take over from the cracks in the sidewalks at the lip of the older roads. It reminds me that everything breathes and fights to be seen. An ancient life, no matter how deeply uh, burned and buried, comes back. 
I'm sure my obsession with urban structures suffocated by all things green and rooted has something to do with where I was born. I'm choked by the city, like it was a skin so tight and thin it couldn't be mine. Whenever I see a weed overcoming a man-made structure, it's like a sign from an old friend. We're here when you need us, just ask. All of Texas is pretty much like this. There's eons of tarmac and hectares of tall, toothy skyscrapers that trap in smog, painting everything in gray blues, gray browns, and industrial orange against the backdrops of horns, shouts, and arthritic tangle of music pulsing out of open doors and windows. Then turn a corner and wham, green, overrun and outgrown, devouring every single bit of rust and iron commanding the shape of the earth, choosing what it is allowed to stay standing. A different kind of loud that enchants and devours the idea that the country is dull and silent. I believe that it has something to do with nature's demand for reciprocity. Everything is so little and give and take, but when people take too much, the comfort and convenience of modern living is repoed. From what I remember, Mama's a lot like this. I try not to dwell on the evil she did, but she's grown out of the earth and daddy took too much too fast. He dried her out and so she hydrated in his blood. She's the storm in a disaster movie and everyone else around her is the unsuspecting civilian. Either learn how to adapt or die. Thank you very much, Abby. Thank you. Lovely. I obviously I know everything, so I'm I'm you know I'm getting ready to imagine the rest, but uh, it it gets really 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 scary. Um. Okay, then now from horror, we are moving back to fantasy. So Jess, would you like to tell us about uh, your story and the inspiration behind it? Yeah. So um, the idea for miasma um came really from a single word, the word cataphract. Um, so this means a fully armored soldier, but etymologically it kind of, uh, it's from the Greek and it's from kata and fractos, which means kind of entirely enclosed. And that just really fascinated me. And immediately I had this idea of a knight in armor that is kind of hermetically sealed, like absolutely sealed. And I thought, you know, why would that be? perhaps they have to travel through a kind of toxic environment. And in what way is that environment toxic? For whom is it, to is it toxic? Um, I have a bit of a fascination about writing about kind of uninhabitable environments and this kind of tension between, do you try and make that environment more habitable or do you just adapt to live in it um, yourselves? Um, so Miasma kind of rose out of those kind of ideas. Um, so it's narrated by a 10 year old boy uh, Nereus Vestrin, um, who lives alone with his mother at the edge of an ever encroaching swamp that is kind of infected with this toxic magic. Um, and if you go into the swamp, um, you become very ill. Um, and when one morning he finds his mother crawling out of the swamp, kind of infected with this um, miasma, um, he has no choice but to summon a mage in order to help her. Um, but mages are kind of feared and mysterious figures. They have been exposed to the swamp before. They're kind of reminders of the ways that the swamp can twist and change people. And her arrival has greater repercussions than Nereus bargained for. Oh, fabulous, fabulous. Okay, so we're all ready and set. Um, I'm going to be reading from the very start. The first time I saw an unmasked mage, I ran whimpering back into the house. Balks was standing in the doorway. Hst, he grunted. Where are you off to, boy? He tried to catch me, but the horror that clutched me was stronger than his great hands. I dodged him and squeezed past, sca scampering through the front room and into the bedroom. There I halted, back pressed against the door, trembling with relief. But as my shock abated, Shame rose in its place. I was already failing Ma. I'd promised myself that I'd be brave when the mage arrived, for her sake. For the past three days, I'd rehearsed the meeting in my mind over and over, picturing myself walking out as our visitor dismounted, extending a steady hand and a solemn grown-up welcome. I'd even steeled myself for the sight of the reptile, all decked out in its saddle and harness. But I hadn't reckoned on the mage arriving maskless. 
Confronted with that, my small supply of courage had shriveled like a moot bloom in summer. By the time I plucked up the nerve to return, Balks had seen to the Major's mount and shown the guest into the front room. The Major's mud-spattered cape hung upon a peg, looking queer and foreign next to my tattered jacket and Mars' old overcoat. The mage herself stood in the middle of our threadbare rug. She was very tall and very thin, straight as a fence post, except where her left shoulder dipped forward slightly, giving her arm a crooked aspect. Her breeches and jerkin were plain and travel-stained. She was buckling on her mask. I must apologise, she was saying. I didn't know there would be a child here. That's Nereus, Balks told her. The son? Balks grunted assent. The mage glanced at me as I peeped around the doorframe. It was an effort not to shrink away again. The mask she'd donned didn't fool me. I was ten years old, I wasn't stupid. Though the scuffed leather concealed the mage's features, even reaching round across her ears and up over the crown of her head, I knew that beneath that blank visage still lurked the face I'd seen outside. I'd only glimpsed it for an instant before wrenching my eyes away, but that was enough to sear it into my memory. The skin crazed with a dense tracery of black veins, hair sparse and patchy on a discoloured scalp, lips the green black of stagnant water. I'm sorry I startled you, the mage said. Emerging through the mask's mouth grill, her voice was soft and scratchy, like the scrabbling of the many-legged insects that scuttled across our shutters at night. She wore gloves of the same dark leather as her mask. I gripped the doorframe anchoring myself against the urge to flee. Ma, I thought, remember Ma. My mother needed this woman, no matter how frightening. She needed the gifts the mage possessed, the talents gained through suffering and disfigurement. And Ma needed them because of me. I forced myself to meet the mage's gaze. Visible through the eye holes of the mask, her irises were as unnaturally dark as her lips, her pupils lost in them like pebbles thrown into twin black pools. I swallowed. Sorry for being rude, maestress, I whispered. The mage inclined her head, a grave acceptance. Nereus, she said. You are the one who called for aid? I nodded hesitantly and sidled around the doorframe to stand within the room. She nodded back. Good. Then shall we? My eyes widened as she removed her gloves. The mage's hands were covered in the same black veins as her face, as though some unknown breed of spider had spun a dark web beneath her skin. Not only that, but across the back of her right hand was a patch of hardened skin, knobbly and dark. Her nails were black too, thick and horny. They put me in mind of a reptile's claws. She offered her right hand to me. My name is Charis Yondarin, she told me solemnly. I come as summoned, and I will serve. My stomach flipped. The rote words... I was half triumphant and half terrified that she had addressed them to me instead of Balks. Now it was my duty to answer, to complete the exchange. Yet, although I knew it had to be done, I hesitated. It seemed an ominous step, entering into a contract with a mage. For Ma, be brave for Ma. I saw Balks shift beside the mage, and that decided it. I stepped forward and took the mage's hand trying not to think too hard about the textures I felt beneath my fingertips. My name is Minerius Vestrin, I said, stammering a little over the formal tone. I am the summoner, and I will pay. A subtle sensation ran through me, a hint of warmth that rippled from my palm up through my arm, then crept across my chest and plunged into my heart. I jerked my hand away with a gasp. I had done it. The deal was made. Thank you very much, Jess. Excellent. Uh, oh, excellent. Goodness. So many amazing books to read. Uh, you know, you've got time to pre-order now. Yes, yes. Go, go and pre-order. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So we remain uh, with fantasy and uh, we are now coming to you, Laura. So would you like to tell us, uh, first of all, about uh, the story and the inspiration behind it? The Lies We Tell Ourselves is a high fantasy centered around the character Fyodradorn, who is captain of a small renegade ship in a world where magic is taboo, forbidden, 
and carries the ultimate penalty if you are found to use it or be changed by it. He is searching for a treasure that his father failed to find and will do anything to find it to prove his father wrong, including starting a war. And the lies we tell ourselves is the story of how that happens, how that progresses and the outcome for taking such drastic action. It is also a story about finding community, um, finding a place to belong, even if you have to carve it out yourself. Okay, great. Okay then, would you like to, to do a little reading for us then, Laura? Um, yeah. There is an old shark in the waters around Keset. It is not the season for her. Ice in the waters around this dirty city of narrow, overcrowded streets where snow lingers until high summer means her prey are schooling together for protection, unable to be picked off one by one. She should starve here. She does not. Fet fed of fat appeasement, she is content to leave her usual targets for now. They, in exchange, do not dare to take the opportunity to turn their great strengths against her in a united front, more afraid of the repercussions of her wrath than the inconvenience of her interest. I, too, would rather face her interest than her ire. That is why I have come to meet her, walking past behemoth ships of trade and conquest and ego, tied, by shore, tied to shore by rope and anchor. Crossed with planks and walkways, they create almost a floating city of their own, their sailors taking advantage of the ice to take their fun in any way they please, forging contracts and contacts with their neighbours, each one of them with stories to tell and legends to claim. One old woman with a gnarled walking stick and the stiff movements of the bitter northern winter in my bones is nothing remarkable, but a sailor is a gossip. By the time I've done nothing more than walk past them, there are six independent bets amongst the Cassetti dock workers and eight across the crew of four different ships that I'm about to face my doom. Even the Cassetti guards patrolling the harbour have swapped coin against whether they will pull my corpse from the water before I feed what lives in the deep below. All for approaching a single ship moored by herself, alone in a wide circle of dark water, the Black Shark of Neon. She is Golden Harvest, a name as infamous as that of her captain, the shade of a man so su supposedly so evil, so vengeful, that even the nightmare did not want him. She moors here now because no port authority has ever succeeded in preventing her, and perhaps if they tolerate this small evil of her presence, no further will fall on them. I have never been one to fear stories of monsters. I have met my fair share in this long life and come through unscathed and often unimpressed, but I would be lying to say I did not share the concerns around me for other reasons. To the untrained eye, with her single mast, tidy ropes and neat sails that, even reefed, seem to make her dance in the cold winter wind, she looks like a toy compared to the giant trade vessels of Brinda, Aroda or Yana. To the trained eye, or the old one, it is clear to see that her narrow hull and sharp prow that her cut through the waves like a fin, fast and nimble. Once, ships like her were the sign of honest trade, news and exploration across the known world enough so that Neon made the silhouette of this shark their national emblem. They are all but vanished now, along with the people who built them, scuttled or burned. She may even be the last, a lingering shade 20 years out of time. As well as the solid purple of Essia, she still flies the black shark, though the colours have faded and the fabric is tattered from the wind. Many times patched and darned from different materials, I doubt anything is left of the original save the memory of it. I could turn away and leave her sitting in Kesset's har harbour. I owe this city nothing. Its fate when the crew grow bored of waiting is no concern of mine. The abomination who runs this ship need never know I ever gave his request consideration. It is an outlandish truth he wishes to share with me. That I am the one he waits for. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. Oh, it is, uh, uh, you know, it really matches the the pirate flag behind you <laughs> and uh you know there is more to come of course so it's very intriguing very intriguing mm. so thank you so we're now moving to science fiction and to different kind of uh, 
places to live with uh, Chloe and Virgin Land. So, Chloe, would you like to tell us about uh, uh, the story first and then uh, the inspiration behind it? Yes, although I'm overwhelmed by all the excellence that's come before me, I want to order all of these books. Um, so thank you all. So um, my story, uh, Virgin Land, is a science fiction. It is set in a world of um, dis dispersed and varied um, human societies across many different planets with many different splinter groups and um, Uh, different polities and interplanetary corporations. The main character is the daughter of a family that has, is part of a very small separatist group that believes that they want to reject the rest of the um, wider interplanetary society and go back to the land to live in very uh, traditional relationships with nature. They believe that um, the uh, spacer society is corrupt and that they've used up all the resources of so many planets that they want to live in this way that they see as pure in relationship with the environments and on planets where no one else is. Um, And uh, this main character, Shayla, she's a young woman and she's gotten the, the dream of, of being a settler, which is that she's actually, she and her husband have found it, have uh, got land on a very empty planet. They have a homestead. Um, they're, uh, there's very few other people have rights to go down onto this planet. It's everything that she should ever want it. But it turns out, as is often the case when you get what you think you should want, um, that it's not actually what she wants. And that more than that, her understanding of uh, what it means to be a settler and what it um, means to live on in a, in a um, chaotic ecosystem is, is not accurate. And not only that, but her understanding of her husband and what he really wants is, is not completely accurate either. And so things start to fall apart gradually, beginning with the arrival of some outsiders to her community and escalating with a accident that leaves her alone with these outsiders. And her world, her understanding starts to open up um, in ways that are both comfortable and uncomfortable. And she begins to realize that the settler life is um, the, the understanding of the world that settlers have is not enough for her. Excellent. So what was the inspiration behind this? Um, so I live in California, which is, if you think about one kind of uh, understanding in the past, the far edge of the frontier. And I also live with the knowledge that that you know, story of the frontier was a very toxic lie. I live on unceded Ohlone land here in Oakland, um, and that the, the quote unquote progress of um, moving that frontier west, I know was a, a very toxic and destructive thing. But also here in the Anthropocene where we all live, we know that even without the invasion of other uh, uh, cultures, lands and other people's environments, even without people, the um, any novel species entering into an environment is going to change it in ways that are um, unpredictable and the sequelae of that can ripple outward in all these different ways. Uh, so I wanted to write about that and I also wanted to um, write about a story of someone uh, building their own understanding of the world. I'm going to invite you to do a little reading for us please Chloe. All right, well, I am going to read from a place that's shortly after the beginning of the story. Um, it's actually the first scene that I wrote when I began drafting uh, this novella. And although I, it has gone through some changes, it stayed the same and it really, it was some, it, it expresses many of the ideas that drew me into the story. So it's um, the end of the day, when Shayla, the main character, has um, earlier in the day told her husband Gerald something that she's troubled about that she saw out in the world and that he dismissed her. Uh, 
um, concerns. So now they've had dinner and it's after dinner. When Gerald talks about his claim on Erda, his voice goes soft, reverent. I can feel how much the idea draws at him, engrossing as a dream. He says, it's virgin land, Shay, unspoiled, all of this. He gestures a full armed movement towards the wide horizon that circles us, as if his words mean anything after all these repetitions, as if they ever did. Lamps in the houses, our houses, windows, throw yellow stains onto the porch where we sit, but our faces are turned outward to the dusk. I nod, even though he can't see me, even though he's not looking. My habits of compliance are like my stays, a rigid and invisible support. They too sometimes make me wonder if I'm smothering in the alien air. If somehow the survey team that rated Erda's atmosphere made some fatal error when they pronounced it benign for humans. Maybe it's some minor trace compound that makes my breath go high and tight in my throat. No, no, that's ridiculous. I draw a breath in carefully, silently, through my nose. It smells as it always does at dusk, the lemony scent of the kudzu strong enough to mask my lingering cooking aromas, or even the smell of our animal sweat from the day's work. Gerald has paused in his monologue, waiting for acknowledgement, and I make an encouraging noise. That's good enough for him to continue on. The shift I wrote into the feeder will get the hosses acclimated to local foliage then. With the clear land, we can get started on the real work. I follow his gaze past the dark lumps of buildings, out across the shadowed undulations of low hills. The kudzu's yellowy, twisting stems cover the land in a wild profusion that reaches higher than our heads. Even with all the times we've cut it back, the new growth still presses almost to the foot of this porch. The scalloped silhouette of the porch's awning and its fluted columns make a black frame for the purple gold sky, where light lingers even as the land beneath it grows darker. It's pretty for once, caught between the scorching brilliance of the day and the lonely darkness of the night. That last is a misnomer. Day and night are equally lonely here. Shay? I realize Gerald has turned to peer at me. I must have missed a cue to indicate agreement. Oh yes, definitely. I can make out his frown and I add, I'm sorry, I think I must be overtired, hoping that will mollify him. He puts a hand on my knee. Oh Shay, you work so hard. For a moment, I feel the warmth of his solicitousness, the attention that softened him when he first courted me. We all have to. It's the price of what we can achieve here. He turns back to the expanse of land. I've lost him again. I say, I think I should turn in then. He agrees. We've got our work cut out for us tomorrow. The crew arrives early. Wait, who arrives early? My mind goes back to the flurry of emotions when I saw the shikra, when I thought it was a ship. The crew to help us clear the land. That's what I just told you. Weren't you listening? Oh yes, of course. I don't know what I was expecting. Certainly not the familiar faces from home. That is an impossibility. It would have been nice to have more warning of strangers arrival though. The work crew is part of yet another plan Gerald made alone, assuming I would adapt. That's what I do. I put my hand on his shoulder as I go in. It's strange that I still find comfort in his touch. It's the same when he comes to bed. I fit neatly in the curl of his body and I relish the warmth of his presence, even as I feel my anxious, lonely mind drifting further and further from the rock of his certainty. I try to leech belief from him the way I leech body heat, and I lie still, listening to the creak of the house in the alien wind, the chirps and other unfamiliar sounds. Things move among the thickets of the kudzu that cover the rolling hills in all directions. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Chloe. Excellent. Uh, oh, fabulous. Uh, after all these uh, amazing readings, uh, um, we can't get enough. So I would like to know, uh, before we say goodnight, I would like to know um, if you can share it 
um, perhaps what you're working on at the moment, or maybe if there is something coming up that we should be looking out for you. So Eugene, would you like to go first? I am currently working on a literary mystery novel. It's a migrant story set in Australia, and it's in a invented place called Serengeti, which naturally I've borrowed from Serengeti. So I'm excited about this one and it will be published by Transit Lounge Publishing. And I also have a time travel novel that's coming out in 2023. It's called Secondhand Daylight. And this one was in collaboration with Andrew Hook, a British author, and he's a UK slipstream author. He writes the literary weird. So it's a little bit literary weird, but it's more science fiction. It's time travel. And you can find me on my website, eugenebacon.com, or connect with me on Twitter at Eugene Bacon. Excellent. Thank you, Eugene. Um, okay, so Andrew, what about you? What can you tell us? Um, I've got... Um, a few historical action adventure comics coming up this year with Commando, um, just done through a Scottish publisher, and is a very different tone from this, very gung ho um, <laughs> stuff um, that I also do. Um, other than that, um, and all the secret things that I can't talk about as a ghostwriter, which is a weird thing, um, I'm uh, I'm just as we record this, I've, I'm just putting the very finishing touches to editing a fa high fantasy novel about a fake chosen one, um, which I've really been enjoying. I, it's one of those tropes where like, there's so many stories I enjoy that have chosen ones in, but I hate it as a concept. I think it's, <laughs> it's disempowering and uh, I have a long, long run about that. Um, so I wrote this whole novel to just kind of like unburden myself. Um, and I, so I'm just finishing that. Um, like literally I've got half a day of edits left to do and then I'm going to try and find someone to publish it um, and then I'm going to start one about art as magic which has been bubbling away in the back of my brain for several years and I was trying to find how the magic was actually going to work like I had all this other stuff I wanted to do and I was like but but then I tried to write it and I was like, ah, but if the, the you know, what does the magic do? And I, I finally worked that out. So that's yeah. that by the time this video gets into the world, that is what I will be feverishly typing away at. Um, so yeah. Oh, we'll be looking forward to all of these yeah, then. Absolutely. So good luck. Excellent. Uh, uh, Abby, what about you? I'm currently doing a finish your book fall with this uh, book that I've, been wanting to do for a few years it's an action adventure it's about a um a former uh government experiment who's trying to live the life of the civilian and then he falls in love with the person who ends up being a little bit more tied into mythology than what he's used to so um, it's going to be kind of an action adventure deal like a uh, indiana jones meets um Cahullin. So I'm kind of just messing around with that. And I have out in the world right now um, a, a, a historical fiction inspired by my indigenous and Irish polyamorous grandparents okay. and how they survived during the, um, the Great Depression and the things that they did. And so there's elements of magic in there. Um, there's also uh, exploration of um, Choctaw Chickasaw life and culture and how it uh, it rubs up against and and, and works with uh, white families that have lived in Oklahoma and during the Dust Bowl. So that's kind of like the big things. Working on short stories, I'm kind of trying to learn how to do those so I can maybe get into a few more magazines, maybe contests and things like that. So, but that's just basically it. No, that's well. That's that's busy. That's good. Uh, it's always good to learn new, you know, new formats. It's true. It's a very different way of writing, isn't it? But that's that's excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Jess, what about yourself? Um, so I've uh, recently ish had a um a quite short short story out with Interstone Digital um called If I Were a Mushroom which actually kind of has some similarities with me, Asper, when I said I'm, you know, into writing yeah. about kind of toxic wasteland. This yeah. also is one of those. Um, but uh, I'm now focusing on longer works. Um, I'm 
uh, working on an adult fantasy novel, as I mentioned earlier, which is uh, kind of inspired by a passage from Beowulf. And I guess my elevator pitch for it is uh, Viking matriarchy versus monsters. Um, so that's kind of coming along, hopefully. Um, and I'm kind of in the planning stages for another fantasy novel as well. Excellent. Oh, wow. Okay. Loads of busy agendas everywhere. I like that. Okay. And uh, Laura, what about yourself? So this is the only thing I've got out at the moment. Maybe we'll see close to the time, but I am also working on an adult contemporary fantasy that was supposed to basically be superheroes, but has morphed more into a resurgence of the old mythologies and what that might do to a modern world as we understand it like mm -hmm. what do you do when suddenly the gods start walking among you again it's gonna it's gonna change things um so, and I've I've got a few edits stuff to do and then hopefully I'll be able to start shopping that around okay. after that I would like to start working on a um haunted house ghost novella that I've had in the works for a while and maybe even come back to the world that this novella is set in for something something else. It would be amazing. In the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's it for now. We'll limit, we'll limit ourselves before I get too crazy. <laughs> no, fair enough, fair enough. It's good to have goals, right? Okay, no, excellent. Uh, and uh, Chloe, what about yourself? Um, I have a few short stories scheduled to come out in 2023, one with Wild Blood in the UK and um, another one with Kaleidotrope, which um, I'm very excited about. It was uh, It's called the Academy of Stories and the Ministry of Minds, and it was knocked out of my brain by watching the HBO miniseries on Chernobyl. Um, okay, yes, it yes. Very intense. Wow. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah. And then I'm also... Uh, working on a novel which I hope to query in 2023 it's a uh, science fiction as well and the elevator pitch is um, virtual reality class struggles enemies to lovers in space Ta -da! <laughs> that's excellent oh wow so you are all going to be very very busy for the next uh, foreseeable well for the foreseeable future that's excellent uh, um well I am uh, really, really happy to be able to share uh, our authors and their novellas with you wherever you are watching us. Uh, um, and thank you so much for spending a little bit of your evening with us. And um, you can find uh, all the details uh, about where to find the books in the description. And of course, uh, you know, any questions after this live chat will disappear, the comment section will remain, you can ask there, and you can, of course, get in touch with Luna Press. Uh, our authors, uh, you will find on the Luna Press uh, website, you will find their links to social media, etc. So you can also find them and follow them there. Okay, so thank you all of you very much for being with us uh, uh, tonight, for, uh, to you at home. So I would say it is goodbye from Eugene, all the way from Australia. <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. <laughs> and it's good night from all of us. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. See you soon. Good night. Mm -hmm.